I, I'm going to introduce Dr. Xiaoping Li. She's going to talk about nutrition. Dr. Li is sort of a superstar amongst our um, foundation in terms of having the biggest fan base with the most people who always um, want to hear Dr. Li speak. So we're super excited to welcome her back. Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see everyone here in person. This is really making all the difference. Today, I'm actually decided to really have a talk for you, for you all. I'm not going to be really lecturing, but it would be more uh, answering all your questions. And uh, the foundation, Aggie and the foundation helped me did a survey. Many of you have answered. Thank you. And as a result of the survey, uh, I got about five pages long questions. Um, so I will try my very best to really group them um, to start with, to hit most of your concerns. And then we can have more time and real time and question answer sessions. So I, I know we have surgeons here, and well, they have their ways to explain to you what happened when you have had a surgery. But here's my version. And look at the cartoon, right? So we have the pancreas over there. But I do want to say the pancreas have two very distinguished structures, and therefore have two different functions. This will help you understand what is happening after surgery, what your body is going through change. And one of them is the blue color, with like an eyelet, and those are special cells making hormones, including insulin. I will talk about that in a second. And those are ferals and the, the uh, pink color, those are typical um, you know, glands made up the pancreas, and they make the enzymes to digest food. So look at their function, and the blue island and is, um, you know, have the endocrine hormones predominantly three different kinds. One actually is alpha cell making the hormone, make sure your glucose won't drop too low. So the name is glucagon. And then the other one we're more familiar is from beta cell, and they make a hormone called insulin. We all know that. Insulin prevents the sugar from overshoot. So those two are really a balanced pair. And there's also another kind of cells called D cells, make a hormone less known, but it's also very important, regulate your motility of your gastrointestinal tract and the secretion functions all uh, together. That is called semidostatin, and meaning it's actually more down-regulating everything. And then the pink eye, you know, the glands have we call exocrine, meaning they are really just making enzymes to help you break down food. And there's a lipase, and their main function is break down fat. And then you have proteas and help you break down proteins, any kind of shape or form, down to just two amino acids or two or three together, we call peptides. And of course, we have amylase. Even amylase, our saliva gland will make some, but it's predominantly made by the pancreas, and that is helping us break down carbohydrates and two you know, single sugars or two sugars together um, so we can, we can absorb it. So this is the function of pancreas and out of the two distinguished and, uh, functions. So this is what uh, happening during surgery. All right, I'm asking for a forgiveness from the surgeons here, and this is the best that I can come up with. All right, look at the green colored area that including the gallbladder, the bile duct, and part of the stomach and duodenum. That's the beginning of the small bowels, and most part of the pancreas are removed. Okay, so this is the Whipple procedure. Now you think about. The gallbladder is gone, and they usually, you know, really concentrate and store the stuff, uh, you know, digestive juice with all the enzymes. Also have, you know, bile. Bile is actually salt to make particularly fat and become water soluble, and so it can be absorbed. 
all right? So that function is definitely impaired. Look at the pancreas. Most part is being removed, if not totally. I know some of the time they do total pancreatectomy and the whole pancreas will be gone. So there comes your digestive problem and, and possibly diabetes because now both of function are impacted by removing the pancreas. That is the reason, you know, after uh, those major surgery, and many of you, if not most of you, will need support for digestive enzymes from an external source. And I'm just giving one example here, and that is Creon. Creon comes at different doses, different combinations, but the nature of it, it is provide you enzymes to break down carbs, fat, and protein. And everyone needs a different amount. And more importantly, different food you eat, you can imagine, would require different amount of crayon as well. Your pancreas is so smart when you had them, um, you know, they know exactly, ah, so this is a food with 12 ounce steak. So I need a predominantly lipase to break down fat, and I need a significant amount of proteins to break down protein, and not so much carbs, right? So it's all adjusted, but it's not the same when you take a creon. It's a fixed combinations. So we have to be learning all together and what food we have, what kind of dose, and to really match up with it. So that is that. And I would not talk about diabetes if you have it. And because this is a diabetes, you by lacking of insulin most of the time, or you have limited capability to secrete insulin, but in a much lesser uh, capacity. But meanwhile, because of a lack of activity or overweight and all of that, you also have re insulin resistance. So that will be no different than we manage um, diabetes, but probably more on the, on the side of you may need external insulin support. So that is something I'm not going to talk about and today. So that is to get a go and to explain to you what happened after surgery. I know most of you here have had uh, surgery uh, already some degree. Let's start with a nutrition question. First one is, Hey, how about the white flowers? And how about the starch and fruit and sugars? And are they going to feed the cancer? Should I really not to have it at all? Or um, should I handle it in a very different way? It, how can I prevent diabetes? And so carbohydrate have three major forms. And the first form is sugar-sweetened beverages, and this is the simple sugars. And we put it into our food or drinks and whatnot. And the second group is the whole grains. They are natural grains, and they contain starch. Starch and sugar, what's the difference? It would be the same as you buy grapes from the store. If you pick up the stem, everything stayed together, that is a starch. The losing, um, you know, grapes in, left in the back are sugars. And when the whole bundle, the starch, get into our small bowels, the um, enzyme, the amylase, like we talked about, will take each grapes off and become singulars, and so we can absorb it. So there's really no difference at the end result. Maybe, you know, the starch will take a little bit longer time to be digested, get into your blood um, by absorption. Otherwise, and starch can be completely absorbed by your body. So the last group is vegetables and fruit. They are not only have starch, they have some simple sugar as well, but more importantly, they have a lot of fibers, nutrients only come from the uh, vegetables, and they also take care of your microbiome. There was a question earlier, how do I take care of microbiome? And I will get to that in just uh, in a second. But let me review, and what do we need sugar for? How much do we need? And here is the basic fact. We all sitting here, if you are a woman and you have about your entire blood right now, five grams sugar only. Five grams is how much? 
one teaspoon or a little bit more than one pack you just put in your coffee, all right? That's your entire blood will have. Yeah, I know the guys will say, I'm a man, yes. So <laughs> slightly more than that, but not a whole lot, all right? Not a whole lot at all. Our body and during evolution learned how to use fuel very, very efficiently. Now, the slides is showing you we're sitting here listening lectures, all right? Every hour you're sitting here, you only burn 8.5 grams of sugar. 8.5 grams an hour. If you have had one slice of bread this morning, that's about four hours you all need. You imagine you had, you know, really, uh, yeah, two slices of it with jelly, maybe peanut butter. That probably is all you need for eight hours, right? So the first thing I want to say are two things you're concerned when we're talking about carbohydrate intake and feeding the cancer. Number one, if you have sugar rushing into your blood, let's just say I just had a, a Coke, okay, or I had a Gatorade, a little bit healthier, 30 grams of sugar come in, simple sugar, get into the blood. And you, I just told you, your blood only holds five grams. And what's gonna happen? Your insulin has to really go up, okay? Your liver has to work really hard to convert the sugar immediately to triglyceride, that's saturated fat. So the concern is all those rising insulins and insulin push the sugar into, you know, one is the normal process, the liver converts to fat, but also forcing other organs to take the sugar so your blood glucose can be normalized. So the theoretical concern with some animal studies suggesting is that during that process, the cancer cells would also get in the sugar and that would promote their growth. Insulin is a growth hormone. And downstream, you know, there's the IGF-1s and all those hormones are needed for organ cells to grow. So that is a concern coming along. So first rule, I would tell you, it is to try to have slow absorbing carbohydrate source, right? And second of all, do not overfeed your body beyond what your body needs. And that is probably most important than anything else. I'm actually giving you an example to tell you the diet we have, what is the problem, right? This is Big Mac and McDonald's med with a medium-sized drink. And one sitting, you give your body 149 grams of a carbohydrate in total. So that is a big number. So you can imagine it would really stress your body and trigger quite a bit of response over there. Now I'm gonna come to just give you a few examples to clear some of the myth out there. And a lot of you say, okay, now I'm not eating white rice. I'm even Chinese, I'm gonna give up rice, <laughs> white rice. I'm gonna eat brown rice and healthier. But looking at the carbohydrate load, is there is really no significant difference and the difference is the brown rice has fiber, and um, you know, that would be have as a benefit. But the carbohydrate load is really no difference. And here I give you more a comparison, brown rice versus quinoa. A lot of people even go for that, particularly in California. Again, <laughs> carbohydrate load slightly better, but not a whole lot. All right, you're looking at 45 grams versus 39. So really, even just whole grain, we needed to give ourselves a fair portions. And do not go crazy because they're whole grains. All right, that's my first answer. And what you really should try to have is how human beings become human beings today and evolved on as vegetables and fruit and particularly vegetables. And they give you, and beyond just carbohydrate, and our own research actually had demonstrated, and you know, same amount of carbohydrate, or let's say you have you know, white bread, adding vegetables even can change the white bread, the sugar being absorbed into your body. And this is also important for gut microbiome. So you have heard the word about diversity. The microbiome, the most important thing is diverse. 
and meaning the garden, let's take example, you know, um, as your gut microbiome. It does not really matter you have a lily garden, rose garden, or daisy garden. Most important, you have m as many different plants as possible to grow healthy and together. What is the best deal to promote that? It is the soil and the fertilizers, and that is the food you eat. And now we, I almost want to say, the small bowel or large bowel are two different organs. Small bowels, the job is getting the nutrient to you for your body to use it, human's body. The larger bowels is really, truly where the microbiome reside. Every bite you eat, the, we used to call the waste, non-absorbed uh, nutrients, actually have a purpose from evolution point of view. They feed the microbiomes. The microbiome break down those large molecules. We cannot take care of them and then release small molecules we call metabolites or postbiotics that in turn impact our body function. And for one example, serotonin controls our mood. Serotonin is predominantly made by the cells interact with gut bacteria in our gut. So the best way, I know there's an easy way we're all looking for special antibiotics or getting other people's uh, gut uh, bacteria by fecal transplant into our own body, but the fundamentals is hard, but it is here. Eating for yourself, a human body, but also feeding your gut microbiota. And I'm saying eating vegetables, you don't have to think, I have to always go for the kale, all right? And <laughs> kale and veg you know, spinach comparison, not much a difference. And also, they all belong to one big, you know, uh, you know uh, family, CRISPRs, vegetables. And all those vegetables evolved in different parts of the world, different weather, different conditions. They have different nutrients. The best bet it is to have as many different kinds as possible. And how about juicing, and uh, is that the best way? Juicing is a mechanical process to break down whatever you juice into small particles. But also you mixing oxygen with it, so oxidation starts right away. And the fruit and vegetables has this barrier with the oxygen to keep themselves intact. But you do lose the nutrients that way. And particularly for those of you who have already had surgery and need help with digestion, cooking, it is highly recommended. Cooking is chemical and physical uh, reactions, and cooking is part of digestion. Human beings are able to walk on our twos, two legs, and we're the only living beings using fire. And not to cook, you know, really for cooking, but not to kill each other. So remember that, and for patient we talk about here, and really cooking food has its benefits. Can I have red meat? Are dairy products okay, right? So here are the protein source, and red meat, the, the concern mostly is the hard texture and fat content, make it more demanding for protease and lipase. So if you want to have red meat, cooking a hell of it, all right? And leave in the fridge overnight. Have the fat removed, they'll be on the top, and you can have it, but you have to really pay attention. If you say, I'm getting right to lunch today, here are the choices on the animal source, all right? There are, there are fish, and well-cooked, and there are chicken, turkey, and there are eggs. And also, particularly for those of you, immediately after surgery, Purified protein powders, particularly whey protein, may offer you benefit. Whey protein is almost identical as to human breast milk. And from that sense, I can also recommend to you, if you don't know what to eat one week after surgery, think about how you fed your kids when they are one year old or two year old. Start from there to adapt your body slowly but surely towards where you want to be. So that would be very good rule of thumb. And for those, uh, how much you should have? About 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram of your body weight. That's a good way 
and two star. star. Uh, for women, mostly about deck of a card size, that's a 20 grams of protein every three meals. For men, it will be a little bit more, like 25-ish, or you know, four ounces each meal is a good amount. For those of us you know, for, um, really care about health and, and, and the world, and go to vegetarian and uh, vegan, uh, it is a little bit more challenging. But I wanted to bring, bring out a couple of things. Number one, the only one you can live in on solely without mixing with others is soy protein. But even soy, lack of methionine, is one of the building blocks we definitely need, and it's very low in soy. The best bet you have is having mixed the source. And that way, particularly after surgery, you have uh, a, a really solid foundation, making sure you have everything you need. But a second rule is what I said, it is a truly cook them really well. Make it easy for your body. Three, because it's plant-based, they're containing a lot of other compounds, and I want you to try out slowly which one your body can digest and which one matches the creon level if you take that at a current level. So all of those are important. As to dairy products, and many of you, more than half of you after we post procedure, either have permanent or temporary lactose intolerance. So I do remind you, be carefully start with a dairy. And the other thing is dairies not only have protein, calcium, what we already know. It does contain simple sugar and fat. And many of you go to you know, uh, really low fat or um, you know, non-fat, it helps some degree. But the, just be aware, even then, and the sugar, it is there. So now we're going to move on to talk about fat. And can I have fat? And why am I having oily stools? So let me just start with the oily stools is a very good sign you are not able to digest the fat. The oil is fat. And it's removed from your body into the toilet. And that is the time you really think you need a lipase. If you are already on Creon, we may need to pick up in a, a preparation, have a much higher dose of lipase. And fat actually is an essential part of our body. All our cell membranes are made of fat. It is something we must have. It is not true the less the fat and the better, the no fat is even the best. Absolutely not. And it is where the fat coming from. Number one is are those plant-based uh, listed here. If for those of you are cooking at home, I hope all of you, and the good fat, uh, you know, oil to use a cook with a high temperature, and also nutrition profiles are good, are listed here. Canola, grape seeds, coconut, recently on the market is avocado oil. Those are the ones that give you high temperature, tasty food. Olive oil is a great choice, but it, temperature won't go high. It will be good for salad and you know, any food you put on your plates. But you know, your, if you use it to fry food, let's like just say, food will be saggy, your kitchen will be smelly, and um, is not the best choice. Avocado, we did a lot of research at our center, is monounsaturated fatty acid. And particularly the area close to the skin, don't ever just take one spoonful, throw the rest of it in the trash. The most of the nutrient, it is where avocado interacts with the environment, getting the sunlight and everything else is very close to the skin. That is where very rich with natural vitamin E's. So do as diligent as possible, get closer to the skin, get the goodies out of there. Of course, and the next one is the tree nuts. And nuts from the tree, they have monounsaturated fatty acid and proteins, and they are very helpful as well. So those are too hard. I talk about food and how to prepare food like you feed your one-year-old. I want to just get a supplement, get over with, right? So first, what, can, what kind of things help me digest? A lot of them actually is coming from spice or herbs. And for example, a lot of uh, during chemotherapy in particular, a lot of uh, folks have, you know, uh, really nausea, vomiting, 
ginger is being helpful, and they also curcumin, you see they're very similar, and turmeric, and they're anti-inflammatory, and more importantly, and for those of you who have taste, um, taste change or smell change, have spices, particularly use a spice to replace salt, can really give you a fresh experience. And those um, herbs and the spices can help your stomach settle down as well. So that is one thing I'm recommending. And more importantly, those uh, spices, and they've been around for five centuries. And when we started the Silk Road, we were not shipping you know, silk from east to the west. And that time we're going on, the number one goods are uh, spices. And they have so much medicinal use. Now we know with today's technology, they have tremendous impact on your gut microbiome as well. Even very small amount, right? We use, usually just have a speckle of it or a teaspoon at the most, but they are very, very powerful. And we do have supplements recommend in those days. Number one is vitamin D. And the reason is vitamin D is no longer just a vitamin. Vitamin D is a hormone. It is beyond regulating your calcium and phosphate metabolism. It actually play a very important role in cell proliferation, particularly controlling it. It won't go crazy. When it's go crazy, it's tumor or cancer. And now we stay indoors, particularly in pandemic, and most of, well, for women for sure, all the foundations we have, have sunblock in it. We go out and we've been told, sunblocks, no skin cancer, keep young. You, everyone want to look young, even though they're 70 years old, right? But vitamin D is our body made and with exposure to UV light. With all those change, we do, oh, sorry, we do need to take vitamin D supplementation. The second one would recommend is fish oil. Fish oil is not made by fish, and fish oil is made by algae in the food chain in the ocean. It gets concentrated in the fish. The longer the fish live, the larger they are, you know, omega-3 is a fat, is in their flesh. That's how we get the fish oil out of them. For those of you vegan or vegetarian, there is omega-3 directly made from the algae. So you don't have to go through the concentration process with the fish. And But I do wanted to point it out. If you are thinking you're getting enough omega-3 from flaxseed, you are wrong. The conversion rate from flaxseed it's a much short chain, omega-3 ALA to long chain is about 1 or 2%. If you go for omega-3, you need an algae form or fish, regular fish oil to go along. How often, I know I'm over time, how often or what time to eat? And that is actually a big area with research, even with a brand new word called chrononutrition really studying and the question being asked by you all. And what I can really tell you today, it is many of you gonna ask is intermittent fasting. And what do we know? Intermittent fasting, it is a tool to help you control uh, intake of nutrients. But for cancer patient, particularly immediately after surgery, and depends on your medical condition, generally it's not recommended you have extended fasting because a surgery and cancer per se is already a catabolic process, meaning exhausting you from your reserves and already start breaking down your muscles. So we really do not recommend. If you have a need, come meet with us. We'll figure it out what is the best for you. As to the questions here, I have answered raw and cooked. As to keto, vegan, or combination or alternating, I think it really is part of procedural medicine and procedural nutrition. And UCLA is lucky to be one of the national centers. And starting January, we're going to test 12,000 people. And with one standard meal to figure out who responds to what meal metabolically. Is that true? If we give everyone the best food we have, better than Mediterranean diet, is everyone's metabolism respond in a favorable way? 
I'm actually going to have people, you know, have the three diet, keto, low fat, and the best diet ever. And I'm going to give in person with two different ways, ship the food to you, 14 days and rest and alternating. I'm also going to have about 100 of you live here, Alaska, 14 days of time to figure out and what diet is your best for you. So the more uh, to come, and UCLA is definitely in the far front of that, and we have to realize we are all different particularly with cancer on top of it. One example, it is showing you healthy people, and if we tested with the same white rice repeatedly, exactly the same amount, your glucose responds differently. It's just one example, and to illustrate, we are dynamic beings, and we actually is changing every single second. And the last thing I want to say is that Nutrition is not about what you just put inside your mouth. It's also about how much retaining and become part of you. To drive that process we call anabolic process, we need activity, we need to sleep well, we need you know, really stress reduction. And all of that will help our body not only absorb, but simulate all the nutrients to become part of us. And this is my dream team, and to support you. There are five of us physicians specializing in nutrition, and we also have three dietitians. And to answer, I will stop right there, and I'll leave um, time for questions. Yeah, we definitely have time. Uh, so again, if you have a question, come up onto the side. Hi, um, my mother is a Whipple patient, and about three years ago, um, we managed to start reintroducing things like red leaf lettuce and, and additional greens that originally, when she first had um, her procedure, she wasn't able to eat. My question is, um, should we continue pushing greens such as broccoli, Brussels sprouts that um, may cause some stomach discomfort um, in the hopes that um, she will be able to digest that further in the future? Should we try pushing things like that, beans? Um. Okay, um, so the question is, you know, she has trouble to uh, readapt it to grains, yeah. should we push it? And I would not use the word pushing, mm -hmm. I would reintroduce, right? Yeah. Yeah. I would try small amount, I would not recommend it try raw vegetables. Okay. I would try, start with a well cooked, and like, a, you know, carrots, simple textured, and to the body, actually, the microbiome even needed time to reshape the whole society and able to adapt to it. I would constantly try in different things. And we put procedure does change quite a bit of our body, so we have to be patient as well. Okay. Thank you. Hi, um, my mom is 84 and um, has just completed two months of chemo. Um, so I am paying attention to what she should be eating and that's my focus. Um, I've come up against her a few times. Um, she likes to reach for um, mixing water with like apple juice and I think that might be too much sugar. And then when it comes to protein drinks, she also reaches for like dairy protein instead of plant-based protein, which is what I'm getting for her. Um, what would you suggest for someone like that? Okay, so apple juice, you know, it has sugars, but it sounded like she's not even eating much at all. So that sugar may actually help, him, help her with some energy intake. I would try to add the apple juice, like soluble protein, like whey protein, the soluble, add some protein there to her. And if you are pushing for plant-based, I would start with the easy ones, like soy milk, and see if she likes it. 
and um, slowly build it up from there. And pea protein is another one, and particularly during the uh, cold time, pea protein tolerate heat really well. You can add water and heat it up, and it would be like very creamy, and try those things with her. The other thing is eggs would be another choice, and often people are well tolerated to that. And I, one thing I did not talk about, if you talk about what, what nutrients are most important out of the three major groups, actually protein would be the most important. If she has any appetite, I would go for protein first. And second would be cooked vegetables if you can. And then if you know, she prefers simple carbs, I will give her that as well. But the protein is really your building block, and more importantly, is your entire, almost your entire immune system. And you will have to give her that. And the other thing is, I do not know her physical activities. And the more she's bed bound, the less appetite she's going to have. So I would really try to get her to chair, to walk around, and to do things so the body has a driver. Uh, really pushing the gastrointestinal tract to get nutrition. Thank you. Um, I looked into it a bit and it said that someone shouldn't be laying in bed for maybe more than two hours at a time because that could possibly spread or encourage the cancer. I don't know if she got to this point at this age, maybe because of her weight and what she ate. So I'm wondering if maybe she did um, get this because of her her diet in the past, and could it be that she now has a microbiome that just needs to be fixed? Is she addicted to dairy and meat, and that's why she's reaching for it? Well, um, I would. Uh, it could could be simple. It could be more complex. If she's mostly bad written, just that alone, it is a major risk. And I for uh, for everyone know here and healthy. Uh, age 50 people, I don't call those group of people older, older or old because they are younger than I am. Uh, bed rest healthy, okay? Bed rest one week equals about 12 years at least healthy aging, all right? So get her out. And for the nutrition part, I would give her what she tolerates and try to change to the better. But those two has to be happening at the same time plus activity. Okay, great, thank you. All right. We, we are almost out of time, so we have one last question. Uh, you mentioned that nutritionally, the main difference between, the main difference between sugars and starches is that the sugars are absorbed more rapidly, so that causes a rapid a spike in, in the blood sugar. Does that also mean that it's better to consume starches towards the end, sugars and or starches at the end of a meal when there's already food in your other stomach to reduce uh, the absorption? Okay, and the, that's a very good question. There are actually researchers showing definitely do not start sugar alone. And sugar with vegetables and others, and it actually your body responds differently. And I would recommend, like I said, if you have limited um, appetite, protein, vegetable first, leave the carbs at the very end. I know we run out of time today, but I do want to say, and we ready to see you in the clinic, but also we're trying to get funding to get one dietitian and to have set up one hour or twice a week or so online so people can just um, join asking questions and uh, really get all those issues resolved. So we're working on that and we're actually just got IRB approval to testing that practice. So any one of you and want to help us to figure that out, see if uh, we have support on the side for nutrition all the time would help you. So let me know and we need your help. Thank you. Dr. Lee, can you tell everybody how they can contact you, what the best way to get in touch? Okay, so my email address is very easy. Z-L-I at ucla.edu. I've been here long enough before the www. Thank you so much.